forgot to put on my microphone, but now it's on. How y'all doing? Come on, isn't Jesus great? Come on, whoa. There we go. Um, Want to celebrate something right off the bat. Of course, we welcome in all the campuses, but not only are we looking, now the closing date got changed on us since we did that video on Thursday. Um, it got changed to the 13th, which is no problem. So uh, they needed to do a little bit more to get their end ready than we thought they would have to at that point. But not only are we looking to do this closing, which is an incredible, incredible event, but it is the seven year, come on, anniversary of our Vieira campus down there. Isn't that incredible? Come on, Vieira! Yeah! That's, uh, it's just an amazing time, and uh, we are really poised for some really incredible things. God is uh, opening the doors, and uh, uh, just like the scripture says, when you give and you're generous, uh, that God opens the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing you can't contain. That's where we're, we're flowing at, and we're really, really grateful for that. So, incredible. Now, uh, the other thing that uh, I've got to tell you today, I'm going a little old school. You okay with that? Also, I mean, I'm qualified. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> qualified for old school. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing I'd like to say is uh, if, you're, uh, if, if you think, and we're going to talk about Christianity, and we're going to th- talk about areas that Christianity is different, where Christians are and should be different, that, you know, I know that some people out there would say, yeah, they're weird. I get it. Um, and if you're new around here or new under the sound of my voice, you're out there listening on the radio, you get this online, you're here in the building at, at our Parkway Worship Center, and, and you're kind of new to all this, and you're not really sure uh, about Christianity, I just want to say thanks for coming. Thanks for opening up your heart to take enough time to, to look and see. And I just pray that God would show you some things uh, today, tonight, uh, whatever time you listen to this, and, and he would show that he wants to do something different than has ever happened in your life before uh, by the power of the Spirit. So let's pray. Father, we do love you. We do thank you for every person in the room. We're so grateful. We also want to thank you for uh, helping us tonight, helping us to get our heart and mind around this thought, this, uh, this picture that you want to get out through this series of different. What's that all mean? Uh, we want to know and we want to understand. I want to know more and I want to understand more. And I, I want you to help me to express your heart, your thoughts, your, your will to your, to your wonderful people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Somebody said. Amen. Amen. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. Here we start in old school. King James. We got no N in front of that. See that? That's just King James Version. Old school. Come on, if Andrew Womack was here, it would be all he would read from. So uh, let me just read it to you. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should shew forth, or show forth, shew forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which, and we'll get to this verse very last, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Peculiar people. Now, this is really the only um, place in the Bible this phrase is used. And if you look at it in newer translations, it's actually going to give you a much different sort of definition of the word. The word actually means God's own purchased possession. You are, I am, we are God's own purchased possession. So this is a really crazy thought, and, and as uh, ungodly and, and, and wild as slavery was in America, it was actually called at one point a peculiar institution. And the reason they called it that is they were trying to soften the blow of what it really was of one man owning another man and calling it in a biblical reference a purchased possession, a peculiar, a purchased possession institution. So very interesting stuff that way. But old King James, I love it. Uh, I think it's easier to memorize. I don't know. Uh, I've, I've done this a long time. But the truth is, we are different. 
Come on, if you know Jesus and you're a believer, we are different. Uh, now, I want to say this right off the bat. That's no excuse to be a weirdo. All right, come on now. You know, a lot of people are just weirdos and put other non-believers off because they're so stinking weird. Knock it off. That is not what the Bible is talking about. You should be the nicest, easiest to talk to, encouraging, supportive person they ever come across. They shouldn't go, oh my God, this, this one's weird. All right? That's not what we're talking about today. Different does not mean weird. We should think differently. As believers, we should renew our minds. That's something we've got to do all the time is renew our minds because the world is pushing in to make us think its way. And so we need to rewrite what's going on in our brains with the Word of God and renew our minds so that we can think differently, so that we can do differently. Come on, are you with me? So that we can live differently, talk differently. Why? Because our values are different. We have a different value system. We believe in, in absolute morality, that there is a moral standard, and it's absolute. It doesn't change with circumstance or situation. We are different. You know, if you, I, I, I don't watch it much anymore, but when my mom was around, she's up in heaven watching now, but uh, uh, she used to like watching Antiques Roadshow. How many people you know what that is? They, they, you take your old junk, and you bring it in, and you find out it's worth a quarter or a billion dollars. You know, it's like, it's never in between. It's like, oh yeah, that's about 200 bucks. And then, you know, it's like, whoa, you got something from way over. And, and what it takes is a person that sees differently to understand what you have, either junk or value. You have to see, it's just like someone who picks up a piece of art. They can see differently. It's like someone who whittles or carves or sculpts. When they look at something, they don't just see the something they're looking at, but they look into it and are able to see differently than most of us would see, and they can see something they can make out of it, carve out of it, something that it can become. I have here a, uh, uh, anybody tell me what this is? A broken file, by the way. The tang is, is broken. That's a good sign, actually, if you're looking for files. Because uh, a broken tang means it's actually really hard. And it's not just... Now, if you buy a cheap Chinese file that's made today, this is a U.S.-made file. I, I can't really say. It's actually called a B-A-S-T-A-R-D file, just so you know. Um, not that you'll do much with that information, but... But, uh, and that it's rusting is a good sign too because it's, it's, it's telling you it's carbon steel and it's hard and it's, it's good for something as a file. But if you look at it carefully and you look differently at it, you might see something like this in it. I made this out of a file. This is horn from a deer I shot. I know, get over it. And uh, um, it's kind of sharp. It kind of, oh, you didn't even notice it. Cut it so well. And so it's, it's a sharp knife, and now I made it dull. But anyway, moving right along. Uh, we see, some people see differently. And, you know, sometimes we're really worried about what people see when they look at us. And I think pretty much we need to get over that, because if we will live our lives to please Him, Amen. I think you'll do all right with the people around you and what they think of you. You know, the other problem I see with, with us being different as believers is, you know, when we get in church, we, we, we stay between the lines. Anybody stay between the lines in church? You don't cuss or chew or hang out with the people that do and all that? Yeah. Um, we we, we kind of we do, we're on our best behavior. Would that be fair? Come on. You know, we're on our best behavior when we're in church. Why? Well, God's here. <laughs> and uh, people we know and respect and love are here. And uh, we want them to think the best of us. So we're on our best behavior. But, but, but sometimes if we don't have the right thinking on the inside when we leave, we can uh, then begin to think normally, act normally, talk normally. And so we're rude to the, rest, to the waitress in the restaurant. Now, Carol and I had uh, dinner with Mike and Pat Black, the missionaries to Guatemala, and uh, the girl that waited on us uh, finally said at some point, you guys are just so nice. <laughs> it's like, really? Aren't other people nice? She said, no. <laughs> people can be really mean, you know. And so we talked to her a little bit and got to share with her a little bit. And she was a cute little tiny thing. She looked like she weighed about 30 pounds or something. But anyway, um, 
You can go home and say anything you want to your, to your spouse, to your children. You go, go home or go to work and school or the store and act, you know, like you're entitled. You probably wouldn't do that in here. And we got to get over that because the only reason in here has any bit of sacred or holiness to it is because you came and God came because you came. And so the different that you are needs to be a different that saturates your entire life. Not just a part of it. So uh, we, could, we could say a lot more about that, but we're not going to. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It, it, we could, you know, I don't want to add words to the Bible, take something away, but you could basically said, if anyone is in Christ, things are really different. We're different. And so we'll be exploring that in our series as we go along. I want to tell you a little story quickly, if I can. Mike Black, who was our missionary in Guatemala, who's been there now decades, um, when he first felt the call, he used to pastor a small church in Rockledge, which Carol and I went to for about six months when we moved to Florida in 1988. And so then Mike began to feel stirred to be a missionary, and he said, uh, as we talked and shared, we've been friends since first grade. That's 60 years. Yeah, I know that seems impossible. Uh, when, you know, I'm only 45, 60 seems totally impossible. But no, uh, we were talking about, you know, the call and where. And he said, you know, I think it might be Guatemala. And I said, really? I have one of my best friends, the guy who led me in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who I worked with for years in Colorado, who is a missionary in Guatemala. And uh, he led me in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then I led Mike in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Mike is the one who led me to Jesus. You got all that? There will be a test to follow. (laughs) And uh, I said, why don't we go? I'll go with you. I'll introduce you to to, to Doug. And he knows everything about it, speaks fluent, you know, Spanish. Let's go. And so we did. And and he was a huge help. And at one point, we were going up to Antigua, which is where 95 or so percent of the language schools in that area are. And uh, on our way up to Antigua, Doug is driving his uh, Volkswagen van, which has a Porsche engine in it. It's pretty snappy. And it has two buckets and then a bench seat. And so I'm in the middle of the bench seat. And in a van, the seats are pretty far apart. So I had as good a view of the windshield as they did, really, almost, sitting in the back seat. And so we're driving up to Antigua, and, and something strange began to happen. Doug began to pray in the Spirit. And if you don't know what that is, you can stop by the uh, Next Steps desk, and they'll tell you. But um, he began to pray in the Spirit. As he began to pray in the Spirit, he would go, now, Lord? And then he'd go, Vroom! and he'd pass a slower vehicle and come back in. So uh, it was a little bit... Um, a little bit like, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. And then he began to do it even on a hill where you couldn't see what was coming, on a curve where you couldn't see just the places that in America there would be two yellow lines. In Guatemala, there is just a little bit more asphalt, okay? There's no, no signage, no lines on the road. And here we go. And so... He did it not once or twice, but now it's getting up to five or six times. And like right before the crest of the hill, he does it. And and Mike's like, you can see Mike is freaking out. And I had an advantage because I knew Doug, and Doug is one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet in your life. And I knew he didn't want to kill us, so I knew something was up, but I didn't know why. I couldn't figure out what was up, but I I was just going along. And finally, Mike... uh, wheels around uh, like, a, like a crazy man and, and says, you have to stop this right now. This is crazy. And Doug, without missing a beat, turned and said, well, if you're ever going to be a missionary, you're going to have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. And he went, Vroom, and passed another slow-moving truck. I was like, holy moly. And, and Mike basically says, he started yelling, let me out, let me out, let me out. And, and Doug started laughing hysterically. 
Come to find out this, this two-lane road, one up, one down, and we're going through the jungle in the mountains to go up to Antigua, had actually a very subtle split, and there would be a passing lane. And if you knew the road, you could pass, and nobody was ever going to be coming from that way. But Doug made out like he was still on the two-lane road, which is what it looked like, and he was passing in the spirit. And he was laughing so hard, he was crying. And in fact, Brian Moore, at one time in Guatemala a few years ago, asked Mike about it, and Mike was still mad to this day. <laughs> I kid you not, about uh, what Doug did to him. So what we're going to work on for the remainder of our time is uh, the, the series is called Different. We call this today A Different Look. A Different Look. It says in uh, the New King James, Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. Uh, several other translations, the NIV ends up saying certain of what we do not see. What's faith do? Faith makes us certain of what we do not see. The New American Standard says the, the faith gives us the conviction of things not seen. Uh, the Weymouth translation says a conviction of the reality of the things we do not see. Uh, the New English Bible says it makes us certain of realities we do not see. And the Williams translation says the proof of the reality of the things we cannot see. And the Montfort translation says the putting to the proof of the things not seen. And the Amplified Version says now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. We walk by faith and not by sight. Um, you know, it's like, like the receivers on a football team. They, they all go out for a pass. There can be as many as pe five people, maybe even six, on the field at one time that could possibly receive a pass from the quarterback, and they all have to run exactly like, do exactly what they're supposed to do, but possibly only one will get the pass. Well, they, they got to run kind of like faith. Even our faith in Christ, when you think about it, uh, if I was to say, who, who has actually seen Jesus with your physical eyes, we might get a couple of people raise their hand. But the truth of the matter is, most of us are believing and living for someone we've never seen with our eyes in our heads. Could you agree with me? Yes. That, that makes us different. <laughs> different. We walk, for we walk by faith and not by sight. I hope you, I hope you memorize uh, 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 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tonight. That today you would memorize 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. See, there's two, two worlds that, that we encounter on a daily basis. There's the physical, natural, temporal world that we live in. And then there's a spiritual, eternal uh, God realm that we walk in and live in as well. Uh, it's eternal. It's spiritual. And uh, you know that song that we sing? Some of you may have picked this up. It says, uh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You know, and if you look in your natural eyes, what that saying is, it's using an example from the Old Testament where the prophet was someplace where they sent guys to go arrest him, and his servant was long like, oh, we're undone. And he said, no, no, relax. God opened his eyes. The guy opened his eyes. God opened his eyes, and he could see there were many more in the spirit there than in the natural and that's what the song's saying. It says, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. See, I could look in the natural with my eyes and say, woo, problem one, two, three, four, seven thousand. But if I can look correctly in the spirit, I can go, one, just start with Jesus, and that beats seven thousand any day of the week. Come on now. And we can see in a, in a different way. 
Um, I will also say this. Our eyes are the epitome of our senses. Our eyes are the epitome of contact with the natural realm. It, it, it is, I mean, it is really, it, it, it's the greatest sense of our eyes, our ears, our nose, you know, our touch, everything else involved. It's the greatest of all the senses. But faith is the greatest thing that we use, that we live in, that we walk in, that we use to contact the unseen world, which is eternal. See, what the Bible tells us is this world will change. But God changes not. The word will not ebb and flow based on time and circumstance and situation and generation. The word of God is the word of God, and it doesn't change. It's solid. You, that's why faith comes from the Word of God, because we can know that we know that we know that the Word is solid. It'll never change. And if God said it, that settles it. Somebody say amen. amen. I love talking about faith. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says this, Therefore, we need not lose heart. It was talking about men. We're surrounded. But therefore, we do not need to lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing— temporal world, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, what's going on the outside, is but for a moment, is working for us far more an exceeding eternal weight of glory. Anybody need a little bit more weight in your life so you don't get blown away by life circumstances? It, it, here's the only time it happens, while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen. The only way you're going to gain an eternal weight of glory is by looking at the unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. For we walk by faith. We're different. Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. See, practically speaking, you've got to use the right set of eyes for the right circumstance. God has equipped me to get around the natural world. I can see, and it's easy to walk on the platform, and not, I'm not concerned about tripping or falling or bumping into things. Why? I have, I have eyes in my head that help me see and navigate and do what I need to do up here. God's equipped me. Now, here, here's the problem. If I close my natural eyes and try to get around up here, then things aren't as clear where they're at. Oh, I hope I didn't put a black mark on my nice white shoes, bumping into that. And then the edge is somewhere there. There's the edge. See, uh, these eyes are equipped for here, but my eye of faith is equipped for the Spirit. You will be just as clumsy trying to live your life with Jesus through your natural eyes as I am clumsy not using my natural eyes to get around in, in the natural. Are you with me so far? Very important. Um, just like, well, take for example, Scripture says in uh, 1 Peter 2.24, it ends with, uh, by whose stripes, talk about Jesus who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, and this is the reason we're not cursed like the Old Testament, like we read today in Malachi, cursed with a curse. This is the reason we're not cursed with a curse, but we still get the opportunity to give. Somebody say amen. Uh, and then it ends up that, that it says, by whose stripes you were, past tense, healed. Now, when you look at your life, through your natural eyes, you might not see this reality. I, I were healed. This means that on Calvary, Jesus did everything that needed to be done through the stripes on his back to purchase your healing. And in the spirit, by the power of God, we're not denying sickness. That's Christian scientist, which is neither Christian nor scientific, by the way. Um, we're not denying that there is sickness. But what we're saying is that I believe this above sickness, 
And so I focus on the promise of God. I look at the promise of God. And now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If I'm living my life and I'm not healed, I begin to believe God and focus on the Scripture. Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. It's the only way we obtain what God has for us. Somebody might say, well, I pray for a guy and I haven't seen an answer. Well, then you better stay in faith. <laughs> because once you see the answer, you don't need faith. You, you could use faith to keep the answer, but you pray. See, the Bible says when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have it. Now listen to that. Think about that for a minute. When you pray, believe that you receive. So when do you receive what you pray for? When you pray for it. Now that's in the Spirit. What, how do you see in the Spirit? You do it by faith. I keep believing. I prayed. We prayed. We agreed. Thank you, Jesus, for it. I don't see it yet. I don't hear it yet. It ain't quacking like no duck. It ain't, I can't see no duck. But I got a duck. Why? Because I prayed. And the Bible says when you pray, and believe that you should believe that you receive, and then you will have it. Now, that can be a little bit of time. For Abraham, he waited 25 years. God even gave him a few sort of encouragements by going out and look at the stars. Start counting them. That's how many kids you're going to have. Uh, walk through the desert sand and kick some of those grains. Look down at those grains. That's, that's how many descendants you'll have. See, God even, even used his natural eyes to point him back to his spiritual sight. So how do we do that now? Well, I don't look at the stars and I don't look at the sand. I look at the word and it points me back to the spiritual truth. I could go a lot longer, but I, but I, see, here's the problem. If you don't do that and you start looking at the problems or you focus on the pain or the, the itch or the, the doctor's report or all of that, and you look and you look and you look and you look, guess what? You're not going anywhere fast. In fact, you're probably start sinking. Just like Peter, when he got out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus, but when he saw the wind and the waves, he began to sink. Why? He, instead of looking at Jesus, he began to look at the circumstances, and the circumstances pulled him down. We walk by faith and not by sight. Because your eyes, you'll see some things that don't really line up with what you're believing for. You know, some, some, there have been times in, in all of our lives when we have believed for a relationship to be different. Now, I have no power over another man or woman's will. But the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he directs it as rivers of water. And so when I am believing for a relationship to grow or to change or to be better in an area, I begin to see it that way. And, and I resist the urge to give in to the signs that it's not going that way. I tell you, you'll live, you can either live your life encouraged or discouraged. You'll be encouraged if you look at the Word and walk by faith and not by sight. And you'll be discouraged if you look at the circumstances and walk by sight and not by faith. It's just an option that we have. And, and we've got to do this. Why? Because we're different. We can't go back, people. There's no, there's no place else to go. We can't go back to that old living and just settling for whatever the world throws at us as, as fact and, and that's where we're going to live and that's who we are. I'll tell you, the world every day is telling you who you are when in fact the Bible is the only, only thing that's able to tell you who you really are. We walk by faith and not by sight. So much more I could say on that, but I, I got to keep moving. I was in India uh, in 1983, and uh, it was an incredible trip. Many, many people got healed, incredible healings. And we were in this one meeting, and, and uh, 
We had prayed for so many people, we were just out of gas. I mean, you lay hands on people for six hours after preaching and traveling halfway across the world. And we were just out of gas. I, I can't explain it any other way. Finally, the guy who was kind of headed up me says, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to pray one prayer over everybody. <laughs> That's it. We can't, we've laid hands on, anointed with oil, you know, for six hours, and, and there's still that many more left to pray for. He says, we're just going to pray for everybody. And as I, as I went to close my eyes, Somebody said this once, too. They, they were asked, why do you close your eyes when you pray? And they said, so I can see. And I got ready to close my eyes. When I did, there was a young girl, pretty young girl, probably 14-year-old girl, sitting really close to the front where, you know, just looked at her. And one eye was just, I don't know, looking over there. The other eye was beautiful and straight and, and worked right in the one eye. And as we began to pray, I just said, Lord, heal that girl. Thank you for your healing power working in that girl. And as I looked at her, it was hard. Because <laughs> that eye is just like, it's all it's having its own little deal, just going over there doing that. So I closed my eyes. And I began to see in the spirit. And I'll tell you, you can do th what, with this whatever you want. When I opened my eyes, her eyes were just like locked together, just like everybody else's eyes, looking straight ahead. And she didn't even realize for about three or four minutes what had happened to her eye. I'll tell you what, looking at her eye, I was losing the battle. But looking at the word... And believing God in his miraculous power and the apostolic anointing, the go forth anointing, we saw healing there. It was incredible. I could preach on this for two days. Fear not. I'm almost done. <laughs> Share one other example. I, uh, I had a wart on my arm. Right, right about in this area it was the kind of place that, that every time your shirt went up and then went back down, it caught on it. Dunk. It wasn't like one of them little flat, mind your own business warts. It was one of them big old stick up there, have like a you know porcupine top and just big old ugly wart. And so I prayed, and I said, God, I thank you in Jesus' name. I receive your healing. By his stripes we were healed. I curse that. This is what I do. You do it. If something's living on me or in me that don't belong in me, I curse it. And I curse this wart in Jesus' name, and I command you to dry up and die and get off my body in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now i got to walk by faith. And every time I raise my hands to Jesus, I'd feel my shirt go, ka dunk junk Every time I put my hands back down, I feel my shirt go ka dunk junk. And and after I prayed, I looked to see if it was gone. There's actually, you can see, can you see that white kind of scar area right there? Can that get give me a kid. They can see better than you guys. Look right here. See that white area right? Uh, yeah, that's where it was. Was, by the way. So I finally got to the place where I said, I cannot, I kept looking, oh God, oh, I look, oh, that thing, it's getting bigger, <laughs> you know, it looks like Mount Everest, you know, it's just rising up out of my arm, I'm like, oh Lord, finally I just said, I refuse to look, I'm just never going to look at this thing again, and I just, I just began to focus on God, and I, you know, just, I think I went three months, physically three months without looking, I mean, I'd even wash my arm like this. So I didn't, so I wouldn't look. I just refused. I said, I'm not going to walk by sight. I'm going to walk by faith. And after about three months, we're, we're, I was in a small group. And we were worshiping. And somebody was up there, you know, playing their guitar and singing. We were singing, had my hands up, and, and I heard in my heart, look at your arm. I went, no way. <laughs> I'm not looking at my arm. I, don't, I walk by faith and not by sight. I felt like, again, a little bit more encouragement, look at your arm. And I thought, wait a minute, that might be God. <laughs> hey, I'm, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But um, I said, okay, I'm going to look. And I looked, and just that little white spot remained. I'm glad that white spot's there. Um, is that dinner? 
dude, I'm hungry. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, I got to stop. Uh, here's, what, here's what we're going to do. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Isn't that right? I'm going to close with this verse 10 that we started with when I talked about us being a peculiar people. We are different. 1 Peter 2.10 says, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God. We are, you are, all of the believers, every flavor, and whether they're from Israel or they're from, you know, Arabian nations or America, we are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Mercy. Christianity is different. Now listen to me, Christians. Because the world doesn't have a, a good view of us all the time. And some of that's our fault. And here's what I want you to know. We are different. But, but we're different not based on performance. You know, could I put it this way? On a moral performance narrative or story. I'm a good person because, in other words, I help the poor, I, you know, I, I, I work hard, I give to those in need, I'm, I'm honest, I don't lie or steal, I don't cheat, blah, 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 blah. But the truth is, any religious person from any religion on the planet could say the same thing. The person that's never met God and has no religion could say the same thing. In fact, they possibly could be better parents than we can. They possibly might work harder than we do. See, it, it, you can't base it on what you do. Christianity is not based on what you do. See, Christianity is different not because we're better, but the truth is we've realized we're worse. And that we needed a suffering Savior to come and die and give us undeserved grace. We're different people because of grace. Because God gave us the free gift of salvation out of his mercy and grace, not because we're better, but probably because we're worse. And so we live our lives with, with a... Can I say it this way? A grace narrative so that everybody we deal with, we deal with from the point of understanding God has given us something we didn't deserve and we're grateful. And my question today as you bow your heads is this. Bow your heads with me, please. Is have you received this grace? Have you received the life and power of Jesus Christ to become part of his family, to become different, yes. It's God who makes you different, will make you different, who will change you, and old things will be passed away, all things will become new. Why? Because of his grace, because of what he did on the cross. If you've never received that grace before, and you think, I need that. You're right, you do. We all do. I would just ask you to say, to acknowledge that by raising your hand and saying, I need Jesus. Thank you, hon. God bless you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Anybody else? Say, that's me. I need that grace. As Christians, we all know we need it. But maybe you're out there and you're saying, I, I want to be different. I need to be different. I need to be changed. Say, so that's me. Just raise your hand. Anybody else before we close? Thank you, hon. God bless you. I want to lead you in a prayer. Let's all of us pray this together. Say, Father God, thanks for Jesus. Thank you for the grace that he won for me on Calvary, on the cross, through his death and, and his resurrection. He purchased for me salvation. I receive that grace. 
I receive that salvation and I call you Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor, would you come?